Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for today's uh, episode on Perspectives of Atmon Energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, thank you again. And um, I am the Director of International Services for HSI, your host. And today we'll be covering the fifth installment of our NERC exam test prep, session five. So this will be a continuation of the last one where we talked about emergency preparedness and, and restoration. So hopefully we get to work from the very end and work our way back. And hopefully we'll kind of cover all the questions on there. So thank you again for the engineering team here in the uh, at the station and think tech to help me uh, get through this challenging uh, flipping of slides and presentation. So, so yeah, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, all right. So uh, here we have a question and typically you see a question like this in the NERC exam. You see a trans, it starts with the transformer is loaded to 150% of its capacity. So it's a, it's a bad sign to start with, right? And the only other transformer capable of relieving the loading is at 90%. So even if you happen to share the load between these two, you will still be heavily overloaded, right? Uh, if you move it like 140 and 100, it'd be like maybe 120 and 120, you still be overloaded by 20%. And in some cases, you can have like a short-term uh, short term rating. Maybe you could, you could do like a half an hour to an hour, but it wouldn't be worth it, especially in a transform. So depending on your company policies, for the most part, you know how should you how should the overload be alleviated, right? So the, the answer here is shed load, and that's a correct answer, the most correct answer. However, let's talk about why the other answers are wrong. So let's let's look at the uh, very first obvious one. So the first worst answer you can think of is remove the 150 percent load of transformer from service. That might happen on its own anyway in a little while, especially since you have a lot of protection in place that controls that, right? So um, a, if you go ahead and um, let that transformer sit at 150%, eventually you might have a, a the relaying might take it out for overcurrent. So these not a good answer. And if you do that, then that, night, that other transformer is going to overload way beyond its, its uh, short-term emergency rating. So that's a bad one. A, uh, the, another wrong answer is adjust the tap changer on a 90% transformer. That probably, probably will not help you. And in some cases, uh, these transformers usually don't have remote. If it's a distribution transformer, you probably can't do it. So uh, one of the things you want to like talk about is the fact that in this case, you may not be able to, uh, to move those taps anyway. They may be tapped out to begin with. And, and the other thing is taps really are to adjust voltages, not really to control the amount of flow going through a transformer. So trying to do that, you're gonna you're going to cause other problems, right? So what's the next one? Raise transmission voltage. Hmm. So raising transmission voltage, um, that's not gonna help you either because what's gonna happen there is as you raise voltage, you're gonna cause another problem and it will be transferred down to the distribution side, right? So that that won't be a, uh, that won't be much of a help, either, especially at these levels of overload. So in reality, all you can really do at this point is shed load. And when they say shedding load, either this is probably a distribution transformer, not really a transmission transformer. So in this case, right, it's probably all you can do here, just shed load. So that would be the best answer in this case. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and work back up to the next one up. It's thirty nine or something. All right. Um, after a forced outage, a contingency analysis study shows that one more outage will cause a severe violation. There is a parallel line out, out for maintenance with an emergency return of four hours after requested. So what must be done first to mitigate this condition? Let's go back and read the question carefully again. After a forced outage, which means a line came out of service without you planning it, it just happened, either a tree or lightning or something damaged the line and it came out of service and it's not coming back. So now when you run a study, CA, continuity analysis, your study shows that one more outage, meaning that now you're at the, either N minus one condition already happened. So now you're onto the next contingency. If this one happens, you're going to have a severe violation. So now you're, now you're, you can't survive the next contingency. So this parallel line, is out for maintenance with an emergency return of four hours at the requested, right? 
So in this case, right, it's going to take four hours to get that line back. If you can bring it back earlier, you know, it, it'll definitely help you, but it's going to be four hours in this case, right? So your next concern here is what must be done first to, first to mitigate this condition? So you can't put the line back in service. I mean, it's going to take four hours, right? There's no way. Uh, B, put the parallel line in service without protection that's that you don't you don't ever want to put a line of service right uh without protection because of the fact that if anything happens it will not trip meaning that's like uh, imagine changing the breakers in your house and putting like a straight wire uh, on both sides you know there'll be no protection at all if, if if a short happens it'll just keep feeding that until it burns down so you don't want to do b either and c take the protective tripping off the line which also is, is another thing that that is disabling disabling or a protection of a line is, is never a good idea so in this case the, the, the first thing you can do here is call the erc and come up with an operating plan here a lot of things could happen they can start working towards getting the line back in service got calling additional crews maybe doing some redispatching either way it's a b or c are not good plans um so calling the RC and telling them you're in this kind of a bind is, is really a good step to, to get started. And this is quite a bind. So that's the first thing I would do in this case. Let's go back up to the next one, 38, I think. Thank you. All right. Loads that normally cycle can result in what during restoration? Okay. So that's called load pickup, right? That's uh, and the answer is C. So what happens with cold load pickup is usually... Uh, you have, and here is what throws you off, right? Uh, because load diversity is is our loads that cycle quite a bit, right? So uh, A or B here, uh, somewhat when you have when you lo lose load diversity, um, I would that's a very difficult one because it was really easy to lean on A. Because when you say loads that normally cycle can result in what during restoration, loss of load diversity, that can definitely happen. Uh, but the first thing that you normally would see is cold load pickup because uh, when you first energize, when you first energize that circuit that's been out for a while, the majority of the load on that circuit you tends to be uh, AC synchronous motors, right? Whether it's it's a, a compressor for an air conditioner or fans or a heat pump or or even an air handler or anything else that runs on an AC motor. Those AC motors, when you first start them, they are going to behave almost like a short circuit until they begin to spin and they come up on speed. At that point, they're, they're going to feel more of a, uh, eventually load levels off, but that can take as much as like 10 to 30 seconds at least, right? Uh, and that's why cold load pickup made sense. The load, the loss of load diversity is to me uh, having that that answer there is a little bit upsetting, and a lot of might be tempted to answer that one as well instead, because uh, load diversity happens when when you have, for example, air conditioners and a thermostat, right? If every air conditioner is 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 off during an outage and you turn them all on, they are all going to turn on at the same time, right? So that loss of load diversity. What will happen uh, during the restoration because of the fact that these, um, until the homes begin to cool off and you begin to then have that sort of uh, AC cycling off and on, right? Uh, you, you're not going to get the diversity again. Here, you're going to get every single air conditioner and every single house running at the same time. So that's why it's tempting. So for me, I would say cold load pickup is what happens first. And then load diversity happens right after that. So I think the best answer here is cold load pickup in this case because of the fact that um, whenever ACs turn off and then turn back on, you're going to see, you're not going to have the impact of cold load pickup as much as you would, right, and, until you have an outage. So that's why I would stick with C in this case, even though A sounds really good. All right, let's go up to the next question. A minimum time that a backup control center must be activated to count as a valid test. Okay, so this is on the EOP008 standard, and uh, they require you to run a test for two hours. So once a year, you got to run your 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 operating plan on these like backup control centers, and you have to run the backup site for at least two hours. So when you do this, right, you have to be at least on for for 120 minutes. It was two hours, and 
uh, the standard, they don't use minutes as units, they use hours, which can really throw you off in this case. So in this case, the answer is C, 120 minutes. And then a lot of times, we usually go a few minutes over just to make sure there's no there's no uh, hiccups in the sense I, I've seen an anxiety, an anxiety exam go, 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 go badly because they ended up running it for 118 minutes. And they were just two minutes shy of running the test because they thought they started two minutes sooner than they than they than they really did. So, so normally we usually run it a few minutes after just to make sure we cover the two hours. But the requirement is two hours is a valid test, which in this case is a one hundred twenty minutes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and scroll to the next one up. Ah, uh, okay. So here's another interesting question. You are a transmission operator with a system operating limit on line one of 90 MBA. So the line one is up, uh, up there uh, joining both both of the actual, uh, both of the, uh, is between both of these rain buses, right? So generator one is at maximum output, meaning it, all it can give you is 200 megawatts. And it's, it's, all, it's, 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 it's all, it's, all it can do for you at this time. Line one and two have the same impedance, right? So line one and line two, have the same impedance, right? So basically, in this case, right, they are the same. So at least here, you know that they, they behave the same. What is your plan of action to alleviate line one? So here you have several options. Now you notice here that you have a, a series reactor, right? So you know that uh, you're already overloading line one, so they don't want you to calculate all these things. So really what you can do here is uh, you notice that line one has a series um, uh, a series reactor bypass breaker, right? So in this case, when it's closed, you basically have bypassed that series reactor. If you open it, you, you're going to, what you're going to do in effect is limit the amount of current that can flow through that line. You basically have increased the impedance of that line. So if you do that, right? Line one, line two, is an impedance. So if you, if you if you increase the impedance of line one, you are now forcing flow to go somewhere else, and you can reduce that. So what I would do is, of course, open the breaker eleven, which when you do that, you force everything through that break. Okay, that's that answer. All right, go ahead and go to the next one up. Uh, uh, a a basement fire forces the evacuation of a reliability coordinator's primary control center. How long? Does your RC have to transition to and fully implement backup functionality? And here's another one where they made it also two hours. So they give you two hours to not only get from your primary control center to your backup site, but remember, it's not just travel time. You have to get in there, park, badge in, get in, sign in, and make announcements, and then say, okay, I'm ready to take control at this point, and then you take control. And that's how long that transition time is uh, is valid. It's not just driving time that that they want to measure here. It is the, the entire transition. That's why it's two hours. It's a pretty handy number because they give you two hours to get from one place to another. They also give you two hours to do the annual test, right? We have to operate for two hours. So really pretty simple figure. Hopefully not difficult to violate, but you'd be surprised how easy it is to take more than two hours to transition from one place to another when it's only a few miles away. All right. Let's move up against the next one. Your system is in the process of recovering from an eight hour blackout during extreme cold weather. Why is a controlled operation switching strategy preferred over the all open approach? Okay, so uh, you have transmission stations, right? And they all have breakers, they all have batteries, they all have battery chargers, right? The, and batteries are what they call station batteries. It's usually like a bank of, um, maybe 60 batteries that each have like a, maybe like a two, two and a half volt each, maybe three volts. And then, and then they give you a total of 120 volts DC. Uh, most of your DC systems in the station relaying, trip coils, closed coils, that sort of thing, uh, telemetry, uh, alarms, RTUs, uh, remote terminal units, all that communications, all of that relies on the battery bank to operate. And they have UPSs, right? So uh, the reason being is that uh, the re now the all open approach versus the controlled open approach means you're only going to open breakers you need to carry out your switching functions and restoration. There are a lot of places what they do is that they'll go in there and start hitting remotely 
open all the breakers, open, 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 open. And then what happens is each time you do that, it begins to deplete the stored energy in, e in, in the battery bank. So ultimately, unless you're ready to, to, to bring power back to that station, because you're energizing a line and a path to that station, I will do a controlled approach here. So that's why B is the correct answer, right? All right. Now, D, uh, to minimize the probability of making a switching error, actually a controlled approach puts you at a greater level of risk as opposed to the all open approach. If you do the all open approach, you basically open all the breakers on a station and then you avoid accidentally picking up load or, or, or tying it to the rest of the dead system. So D is, D is not a good answer. Uh, a, minimize code load pickup. That doesn't make sense because in reality, you're in a transmission, transmission system, right? And uh, in reality, when you do that, you're only going to operate the, uh, in this case, you're, you're operating transmission breakers. You're not really messing with distribution yet. Uh, to expedite the restoration process is probably not a good reason either because remember, everything is supposed to be about reliability, not really about speed and getting it back on, right? So uh, really, it's what you're trying to do is preserve the battery power. And these batteries are only good for about maybe eight hours. So uh, the longer you can preserve them, the better. Now, if you want to do the all-open approach because you have uh, the next station over is energized and you're ready to switch that station in and energize the transformer, energize station service, then it makes sense to go ahead and do the all open just to avoid any 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 hiccups. And you're going to have to anyway, because if you energize that station, you're likely going to connect it to the rest of the dead system, which is why you want to isolate it. So that's why B is the correct answer. All right, thank you. Let's go back up again to the next one. To be effective, to be uh, effective, not effective during a black condition, RTU should not be powered from an AC source. So like, like I said earlier, right, uh, everything runs off of DC source and UPSs. So uh, you don't see this anymore. You see everything running off of battery, uh, station batteries. So for the most part, that's what you run, for example, everything on either a battery bank, DC power source, or, or UPS. So here the, here the wrong answer is an AC power switch. And really important thing to read the question carefully. Is to be effective during a blackout condition, RTU should not, and they put it in bold, if you notice here, be powered from. And that's, of course, you should not be powered from an AC source. That's B. All right. Let's jump to the next one. So, and a BA that's experiencing an operating capacity or energy emergency shall communicate its current and future sense of conditions to its reliability coordinator. So that's usually when you're setting off an EEA alert. Uh, as part of the EOP 004 standards when when you for, for, for reporting. Um, so here uh, that's one of the uh, that's one of the first uh, that's one of the first people you notify, right? It's the reliability coordinator. And the the, reli the reliability coordinator then decimates that it disseminates that information to all the other BAs and TOPs and RCs in your region. So the first thing you do of course is talk to the your RC in this case. Okay. All right, next question up. 19. During system restoration, which of the following transmission lines would be the best choice to energize the facility? Okay. I think we may have covered this one last time, but it's important to, uh, to, to revisit this. So, uh, so remember during a restoration process, you are going to have none to very little load. The only load you're going to have on your system is going to be just to balance a little generation you have. So you're not here to restore customers yet. You're here to just make sure you can get generation online and energize the very vital transmission systems to start building your system up again, right? So the characteristics of transmission lines is that uh, you wanna, you're want you going to experience very, very high voltages in some cases. So what you're doing here is to make sure that you minimize high voltage issues, especially since they're all like very, very uh, lightly loaded lines. So in this case, a line that's going to produce the least amount of voltage headaches for you is going to be the shortest overhead line, which is choice A, 10 miles overhead transmission line, right? Anything that's underground or a cable is like a giant capacitor, it's not going to help you. So B is not a good answer. Uh, D is perhaps the worst answer because that'll be like the giant capacitor generator. I mean, the, the giant bar generator in this case. And then a 25 mile overhead line is also not a great choice either. So the best one here, comparatively speaking, really is A, a 10 mile overhead transmission line. All right. Thank you. Let's go up to the next one. 
Okay. In the early stages of system restoration, the frequency is 59 hertz, 59.0 hertz. It's pretty low. So how much load should the system operator shed to restore frequency to 60 hertz? So again, this is like a rule of thumb uh, application, but but it shows up in the, in the test. Usually here it's a six to ten percent of the connected load gives you a one hertz relief, one hertz improvement in your system frequency. So following that that particular uh, rule of thumb, check answer C is the correct one in this case. That that'll give you. So and, and again remember right if if you if you have low frequency shedding load will speed up your your system. If you have high frequency picking up load will slow down your system. Okay, so that's kind of what you want to work towards. So the, the amount is at six to ten percent of the connected load okay let's go to the next one up 17. during the initial stages of the system restoration process load pickups should be limited to what percentage of the total synchronized generation right and it's important here because th there's a little difference and we'll go over it in a minute another rule of thumb here is five percent right so say you have you have 100 megawatts of capacity already synchronized to the system, right? Synchronized. You, you've only picked up like maybe 20 megawatts at this time, but you still shouldn't pick up more than blocks of five, me five megawatts at a time, 5% of it. Uh, and that's and that's really the important thing because you can't, it's not really what's remaining in the generator, it's what's the capability. And a lot of that has to do with governor control, right? And drew, and that's why the five percent is the is the rule of thumb in this case, right? So five percent of the synchronized total synchronized generation. Now you could have several generators online synchronized already for a total like 300, 400 megawatts of capability. Well, in this case, you can pick up uh, ten percent of that will be blocks of twenty megawatts at a time. Remember, a lot of that has to do also with the ability for the generators to be able to respond to that load. So when you pick up those blocks, if you pick up a block that's too big, uh, you could. You can definitely uh, trip a generator out of service because of the fact that you you put too much load in the generator too quickly, couldn't respond fast enough, and uh, it, the the frequency slowed down, decayed, and then thing tripped offline because of an under frequency in this case. So that's why you want to limit it. You can definitely always do less than five percent. That in fact that'll probably be like uh, the more prudent thing to do. So if you do like a two percent, you know that'd be even better. But again. The question here says during the initial stages of the demonstration, load pickup should be limited to a percentage of total synchronization, which means that you cannot go beyond five. Five percent is your limit. And that's what you're asking here, the limit. All right. Thank you. So it's an interesting question. All right, let's go back to the next one. 15. Ah, here we go. Energy emergency alerts. So you hear, just look at your answers real quick before I read the question. You got level zero through three. So let's keep that in mind. Let so and what these different levels mean. So when you say balancing authority A has implemented rotating blackouts of their native load customers due to a generating the generation deficiency, right? So that means that they're already, they don't have enough generation. Uh, what level energy emergency alert would the RC declare for this balancing authority? Okay, so in this case, let's figure out what, what the different lead levels are. <clears throat> level zero just means you're, you're, you're over, you're done, you're back to normal, so you're completely backing out of this whole situation. So things are really good at this point, right? So no, you, you don't start at level zero. You usually announce that when the whole situation is over. So it's not it. Level one means that you have everything you have available running, but you're still able to withstand the loss of your most severe single contingency. That means that if you have 10 megawatts, I mean, 10 units, each of them are... Um, 100 megawatts. Uh, well, in this case, your most severe certain contingency is uh, is 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 um, your largest unit, right? That you have on that. So, say you have, for example, different different generators, and one of them is 50, the other one's 500, the other one's 200, the other one's like a thousand megawatts. Well, a thousand megawatt unit will be your more severe single contingency. That's why. So that will be the one you need to be ready for. So that's so a level one means you got all that, but you can still cover that one loss. At EEA two means you have everything running uh but you're you're now you now have have eaten into that reserve meaning that if you do lose that largest unit you will then have to shed load so you are no longer able to actually run your uh meet your 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 reserves for your most severe single contingency that so that would be a level two but you still haven't you still have, don't have a need to shed load yet level three means now you have 
exhausted all your generating resources and the load just kept climbing. So now you have more load than you have generation online right now. So that means you have to start shedding customer load. And that's why you would issue an EEA level three. Okay, I think this is all the time we have for today. I think we actually made it to the halfway point and we made it back as far as we did from last time. So I think we finally met up here. Um, again, thank you all for uh, today's session. We really appreciate this. And um, again, if you have any questions on on on, on these exam um, exam questions, again, right, feel free to send me a note. But I also encourage you to go ahead and look at the uh, HSI exam nerd exam prep program. Really, really helpful uh, in a lot of cases, right? Uh, and if you don't do ours, I mean, at least find one. But uh, I think we're pretty happy with the, with the way ours provides results in this case. But again, just feel free to write write me a comment or or message, and I'll see if I can help you with that. Uh, again, thank you for joining us on on this one, and uh, we'll join you again soon. Hopefully, I think next time we'll have like some um, we'll, we'll talk about something different. But I, I think it was important that we looked at these different exam questions over the last few episodes because I think we definitely uh, get a lot of response and a lot of questions about them. So, again, thank you again, and have a wonderful afternoon, and see you in a couple of weeks.